Greetings, programs. It's Hanker and Furnail here. Welcome back to Drunk as Dragons for an awesome episode. How to play D&D just a little bit more better than you used to, like a grown-ass man or woman. No BS this time. We are getting right down to this monstrosity right here. It is none other than the Battle Arena of Death. <laughs> Is the battle arena of death, you might ask. Well, it's nothing short of a battle arena of death. First thing I wanted to show you was uh, escalating target or like target damage. It's like difficulty damage. So that means that as you're playing, difficulty is going to increase and increase, make things more tense and more tense, and probably wind up killing people and, and sort of ending things in chaos. Okay, then secondly, I wanted to show you compound timers. So, uh, Bless the ICRPG player community right now because they are starting to invent different ways of crisscrossing timers and it's very awesome and it belongs in your game. Secondly, how do you come up with all the stuff that should make a battle arena interesting, right? You're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to do a lot of discovery. There's not a lot of plot that's going to unfold. So how is this going to be dope? Well, that's what I'm hoping to show you today on Drunkens and Dragons. So let's jump into this bad boy. Target damage, difficulty damage. Right over here, I have my big D20. It's up, well, with 10 up right now. So I'm gonna start with my target at 10. So when, you're, when your room DC is 10, there's all kinds of wild success happening. It's fantastic. Everybody's just living in the age of Aquarius. It's really fun. So just start there. Every time that a timer runs out, one of these guys, right? So this one's on two. So in two rounds, that timer runs out, and this is going to escalate up to 11. Woo, oop, like this. And you can just take a, a tea light and put a little glue on top and you'll have a illuminated D20 like that. So every timer, which is variable in how much time it is, that is going to escalate. Now this comes right out of the 13th Age Escalation dice design and it's a natural progression in index card RPG as the players of that system have been demonstrating. It's like timers can work on rounds, they can work on turns, and you can have multiple ones going at the same time. So rather than saying difficulty is going to ascend at a certain time, it ascends as the timers are running out. So it's always going to be the right moment. It's going to be an exciting moment. What are the timers, Hankering? You're freaking out. You're forgetting the details. No, here come the timers. So you guys might see I have 4d4 out on my battle arena here. Each one is when this door is going to open and stuff's going to come out. Then I've set up two rounds for each door to spawn. Okay, so at the beginning of the game, you've got your, um, and you have to have a big rock in the middle of the arena, right? In the beginning of the game, you have your three characters or your party, right? They enter from right back here and they're, they come up from the prison cells down here. They, they're escorted up. They come up. This is the exit. Uh, as they come up, this huge wall of spikes moves into place and seals them in. So they're not being pushed in by, like, spearmen or anything. But they're blocked in by a wall of spikes. Okay? They come in, and when that happens... Gah! Ooh, how good does that feel? And then just put them nearest to where they fall. Boom. You have just designed your whole battle arena. It's going to be enough gameplay for the entire night. One, a three, and two fours. So basically, they have an easy first round. Difficulty goes up to 11. They have a second round. Actually, that's a good amount of time later. Difficulty goes to 12. Finally, this round happens and both these doors open at the same time. Difficulty is going to pop to 13. And they're going to have more twice the enemies they're used to. So that third sort of moment is going to be the third timer running out, which is four rounds from now. It's going to be huge for them. So they really need to get like single attack kills to move this forward. Now, this is hilarious actually how this played out because... I know you guys can probably see what's in store here, but now we get to go through it, okay? So, the players come out, this is Vig, and this is Drum, and this is, of course, the Beast of Arlston Chain. So if you guys are curious about these characters, um, the full novel about these characters and why they're in the fighting pits of Arlston is on Patreon, so hop over there and check it out. He is also bound to this massive lodestone, okay? They've got it, like, welded onto his belt. So he can only walk about 10 feet before he's tethered to this 20-ton lodestone, and he just can't break free of it. They're tired of him escaping, so they put, like, mega adamantium chains on him. So that's your setup. You've got a couple crates here, some torches. You've got some fire pots, right? Standard stuff. Here's your banner of war. There are people all around up here cheering. 
You know, the desert sun is sliding overhead. Oh boy, you can feel it. You can feel the, the electricity in the air of the battle arena. Okay, so let's play through the timers. So I'm just walking you through how the setup on the board is going to give rise to the game. Now, you wouldn't want your players to see all the miniatures that I have set up by each door. So I actually had an idea for the video where there'd be a black box on each one and they did do the whole thing. You can manage that. You can put it under your screen or under your table in a little drawer here or in your rolling box, whatever. But you want to have these minis ready because the minis are how you're going to design the game. You're not just going to write it down on paper. That would be difficult. You're just going to look through your minis and go, hmm, that's kind of a cool thing and stick it by a door. That way you're not making all these brutal decisions. But there's another way that's going to help you that I'm going to get to in just a second. This timer runs out. Boop. The, the uh, difficulty pops up to 11. Right? This thing opens and wave one of this door enters and it is two wave elementals or water elementals. So they're in the form of these sort of big crashing waves, right? And they come out of this door. I mean, right away, this is an awesome start to things. So it's like... The battle arena of Arlston begin! And this door goes up and just these huge masses of water come splashing in. That's super kick-ass and unexpected and awesome. So right away the characters are just like, holy, what the what kind of battle arena is this? This is BS. So these things come out, they crash against the center stone, and then they see their faces and arms in these masses of water, and they sort of look over at them with predatory hate in their little watery eyes. <laughs> How do you know when they're crying? You never will. They turn against them. These guys get a turn. He comes up, takes cover here. Drum says, screw it. Fires an arrow, does some damage. Chain reaches the end of his leash. And ah, he's enraged by that. Turns around, does a perception check. Realizes he needs to do 10 effort of strength against this, against this thing. It is indestructible, but it can be slowly bent. So he's like, I'll do it. Uh, does the check. Rolls up five in effort. He's halfway done. Moving on. The water elementals come crashing in. These timers are all counting down. Look at that. How exciting is that? Great. Okay. Hold on. Got a little exciting. This door closes too. How did you pick the monsters, Hank Grin? How are you going to make all the gameplay on the monsters? How are you designing the monsters? Well, that's where this little gem comes in. So first of all, I literally just pick miniatures that look cool. And those are the monsters that I'm going to use. I just... Just completely visual, whether they're cutout miniatures or 3D or whatever. It's just whatever I'm in the mood for, and it'll be awesome. This is the hero roll or the monster roller table from the Index Card RPG Core. It's two pages, four D20 tables, and basically you just roll these suckers up, and it uniqueifies monsters. Okay, so this is a mutated nest of. Of what? Oh, there's like a bunch of junk in the water as it washes into the arena. And then finally, the upgrade portion, they, they're armored. So, yeah, so these waves that come crashing in, they've already killed the past gladiators. And they've got chunks of armor all churning in the water, and it for forms a deadly effect, a weapon damage effect. So as the water crashes over them, all this tangle of junk and armor that's inside the water is just cutting them up and everything. I didn't really think of that when I pulled these miniatures out, but the tables gave me that idea. These are, it's like a nest of these things, which doesn't really apply, so just throw it out. But they're mutated, and in what way? Well, they have all this junk inside them, so their damage should be far higher. Make them a one-heart creature, and they're doing weapon damage now, but they have like plus four on their ultimate because of all this metal inside of them. So if they do roll a crit against you, you like get two shields in this water that... God, that's horrible, actually. Okay. One, use miniatures to pick your monsters. I mean, why not? You don't have to write it all down, do your homework, and kind of do it that way. You can just look at your collection and be like, hmm, I don't even know what this thing is. But this thing is awesome. I'm not going to have it attack. And what I do is I theme them into groups. So I have my two little demon succubus girls. And then I've got, like, demon Snoop Dogg and this super duper demon. So that's wave two. So I've got two waves on each one. So here I have this weird reptile thing with spiders and then a giant spider with two little reptiles. Over here I have Warforged guys. So I have three Warforged guys, and then as wave two I have this Arthas figure. He's like a giant mechanical guy. Then over here I have the two wave elementals, and for wave two, uh, no pun intended, I have a giant shark, which is going to be like a flying sort of shark. Yeah, 
It's a flying shark. Here we go. We got some rounds in. They managed to get one of these things down, all right? They're killed. Here, we'll kind of go back here since it's conceptual. Then this other thing is still around, and this timer counts down, and we get another bump on difficulty. So difficulty is now up to 12, and things are getting hairy. This door slides open. The two succubi enter. Drum is like, this is crazy. I'm going to investigate those supplies over there. He's looking at the supplies. He realizes it's going to take some work to smash open this crate, but it looks like there's some kind of bomb in there. So he's doing, again, like non-combat effort. That's a big part of ICRPG. Or maybe he's trying to pick the padlock off this barrel and there's like gunpowder in there or something. The succubi are in here casting dominate person. Uh, no pun intended. Chain is still frustrated. He manages to break the lodestone. And he's finally in combat, smashes this thing into oblivion. We got some countdowns happening, countdowns. These guys go, maybe one of them is killed. You guys see I'm just kind of fast forwarding. These both count down at the same time. Difficulty goes up to 13 now, which is kind of getting serious. And then, to make things worse, we've got all these guys. These are the rocket pig, spiders, and then I've got my warforged legion here. All these dudes. Holy crap, now the table has become in insanely lethal right away. Now here's where they need the treats, okay? First of all, they have four sources of open fire. Always useful in combat. Next, I don't know if you can see it on camera there, but I hit a little pile of cannonballs over here. I don't know what they're going to do with cannonballs, but I'm sure they'll think of something. Then they have their rock in the middle, which could either be toppled or hidden behind or wrapped or something. Then they have this lodestone with this big length of chain on it. And then they have the explosives in the crates. So they get to the crate, a uh, drum figures it out, and da da da, gets the thing over here, there's a huge explosion, it like gets rid of these guys. You know, there's a bunch of combat. Chain is in battle now, so he tanks all three of these guys. Vig kills this succubus. Then they rejoin. Somebody almost dies. There's a spider. Oh my god. Notice now time is sort of not counting. Why isn't time counting? Oh. Well, when you feel like it's time, which should probably be like one round lagged after a door opens, you can re-roll that door. Or you could let them do one round and then go, the crowd is like hushed. And they all sort of go get a snack, and one guy quaffs the beer, and he says, "More!" And then there's all four timers again. It's kind of fun to roll all four timers together, but you could also do them, you know, one at a time as the doors go. It's all up to you. Then he fights off these Warforge guys. Oh my God! Gears and mechanical blood are flying everywhere. Chain is like, "Ah, I'm still a badass." Spider winds up dead. Of course, that spider winds up dead. This thing exploded. Then we've got a one on this timer, so wave two comes in. That's giant spider with snakes. How are they going to survive this, you ask? Like, this is too many monsters and stuff. No, remember, always do high damage spikes, low hit points on your monsters. So they're super dangerous, but they get out of the way quickly. That whole thing we just mega fast forwarded through would be easily an hour and a half of gameplay. And make sure to move the battle around. Okay, so let's say they kill this giant spider, right? These guys actually have this crazy ability where they drill into the ground and appear over here. Drill into the ground and appear over here. So the player's like, oh, I'm gonna go out, and then I'm firing an arrow. You know, then they drill into the ground, go over here. This kind of stuff is not only gonna eat up a little bit of time, it keeps things interesting. So that when the shark shows up, they're not just sort of where they were. They're just not just tanking and spanking, right? And then finally, Arthas comes in. He's got like cone of cold, and he's got like can freeze the floor and make it so everybody's slipping and sliding, and then he can like freeze one person in a cube of ice, and so on and so forth. This thing winds up dead. This thing winds up dead. Round two of these guys finally come in right as they're f sort of fighting Arthas, and then the shark is taken out finally. And now they've got this big last round that the demons can fly, so they, they sort of make a deal with Arthas that they can escape the arena if they join forces against the demons and they get the charisma roll to make it happen. So now the four of them unify against these demons. They can't hurt this demon at all. They realize they have to kill Snoop Dogg. They take him out. Then this guy starts taking damage. He's flying around. Oh my god. Chain gets pulled up. He falls. Vig almost dies. Drum's like bleeding out and sort of cauterizes his stump on the fire pot and they manage to kill this thing and of course look up at the uh, you know the the snide guys in the audience and swing the lodestone around on a chain because of Arthas's added strength and then it flies up crashes through the wall and like kills a bunch of the spectators and the main guy who owns the place opens up the wall and they're all like ah we gotta get out of here come on freedom and Arthas makes it to the edge and he realizes he doesn't want freedom he wants revenge 
So he turns around back into the arena and he just starts blasting the audience with like cones of cold. And the whole thing is crumbling down behind them as they escape. Yeah, that might happen. No! No! How did they even get that thing in here? We can't leave Arthas to fight the Agnar alone. And then they go back and emo Arthas is the king of the undead. They help him because no one can let another be eaten by an Agnar. That's just a fate worse than death. So they fight in the Agnar. Drum gets up here and he's, of course, he's riding it. There's always somebody riding the Agnar. Oh my God! Oh, chomps down. It bites like Arthas' whole half of his torso and his arm off. And he's like, oh no. And they're, no, Arthas, he says, it's better this way. And he dissolves like into icy ashes. And they're like, oh no, well, leave the Agnar to do our terrible work. Come on, flee, flee for your lives. So they flee. The Agnar doesn't care about them. It's just feasting on the crowd. And that's the scene that they see as they escape into the countryside, is the Agnar like jumping across the arena and parts of it are collapsing in, ch chomping down like six villagers at a time just in an Agnar pie-eating contest. Yeah! That is how you do the Battle Arena of Death. What I did was roll a bunch of timers on a series of four doors, set up miniatures that I thought looked like thematic waves. There's two waves per door. The second one's a little worse than the first. Or you could reverse that. You can make the first one a little harder to mix things up. Then I let the timers do the work as far as how the whole game plays out. Narrate the hell out of it. Escalate your difficulty. If your players aren't used to that, then all the armor class variation of all these enemies will give you that variability. And put in a few tasks that aren't combat. Like figuring out the cannonballs. Uh, unlocking the barrel or uh, sort of you know, releasing the barrel. Whether it be prying it or unlocking it or figuring out a mechanism. Then there's breaking free of the lodestone and or moving or using the lodestone in some interesting way. There could be maybe hacking these doors, figuring out a way to use the doors as an advantage, using the fire, non-combat tasks that still require work or effort. Maybe this banner could be used to skewer something. Um, maybe this spike wall could be, you could lure the Agnar into it or lure the shark into it or something. So be open to all that stuff. And I know you guys are open to all that stuff because you're awesome DMs and that's how it goes. So this is one of my simpler room designs, right? But there's a ton of gameplay here. It's all combat pretty much. But remember, role playing happens during combat. They are not mutually excluded. It's not like we're battling now, so I guess I'm not in character. No way. Your actions, how you handle danger, death, peril, helping each other, Overwhelming odds, underwhelming odds, how you handle all that and what you say, that is your role-playing. That is your character. Especially if you introduce these sort of jerks who are out in the crowd, who are making money on the, the suffering of all the gladiators and have for decades. And they're like, you know, they're like sort of mean, mustachioed, shady-looking dudes. They're kind of sweaty and the women around them look kind of miserable and scared. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you got to hate these guys. And they're running this joint. And that puts that spin on it. It's not just... Battle Arena, go. There is an, a wrong spin here. This is evil. And as for context, you can have your, your characters, your heroes, down here in the dungeon level for the past two months rotting in the dungeons. And then they finally get the show together and they're ready to present the show. And so one morning they come down and they like rouse your players from the dungeon and they lead them up this corridor and they hear the crowd going, ah, 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 ah. and it's just like, oh, shit. Yeah. So the context and the story level of Battle Arena of Death can be as deep and as nuanced as you like, or as shallow and video gamey as you like. I just recommend using a monster roller. You can write your own monster roller, but basically what it gives you is like, I know this guy is going to have like 20 hit points and, you know, probably like a melee attack. That doesn't really fill me in on what's unique about him. Well, he can fly. I know that much. He's got four arms, so I'm thinking grapple. And he's a demon, so I think he's either got like fire or mind control magic. That's actually plenty. I mean, and that's not something I have written down. I'm just thinking that, and I put it out there, and we're just playing it as a table. This is Snoop Dogg, and he's like a skinny little demon who has a like a field of protection on his big bro. And so, as long as the, the field of protection is up, this guy can't get hurt. It's that simple. This guy has like 10 hit points and a melee attack. So it's just like... Super, super clean, simple stuff so that you can run it quickly and kind of off the cuff. Spiders are fast and have some kind of poison thing. Right? These guys drill because they're wormy, snaky things. This guy has web because he's a big webby looking thing. 
Just let it be, and that way all your energy can go into making Battle Arena of Death fast and exciting and crazy and have a lot of energy to execute it and just enjoy having a, a nice detailed table to stare at and to be like, oh, I'm going to roll my 20 right on there. It's a three. <clears throat> Finally, uh, one last recommendation for this high energy video. I do strongly recommend getting your hands on one of these. This is a little oddball here. Boop. This is a directional dice. I got this at Gen Con. It's a, it's a Chessex dice. Um, you can just look up Chessex directional die, and basically what it does is it'll point a direction for you. Isn't that great? So I normally do like a 1d12 and then I count on a clock, but this way it just points. And this thing's going to point at somebody. This is like evil spin the bottle. So if you have this guy, say, does a, a jet of fire out of his nose, in which direction does he shoot it? You can just do this. And it gives you an arrow, and then you just run a line. It's so great. So this can add a lot, especially if what you're trying to do is get a feeling of almost a co-op game. In a battle arena, since there's not a lot of story to reveal, the role of the Dungeon Master is much more like a board game officiant rather than revealing secrets and revealing world and improvising story and stuff. It's more like you're just sort of officiating a co-op board game. And if you put yourself in that mindset, you're going to be so free from so many things, you're just going to be in there with players having a great time. That's my advice. That's how it went down. No BS in this video. It's rock steady, wall to wall. Room design. So many D4s. I'm gonna roll them all to roll for the doors. Rolling 4D4 to open up a gladiator door. Rolling 4D4 to see what monster comes out onto the floor. We're rolling 4D4 just like Al Gore. Rolling more 4D4 than ever before. What's coming through the door? Strength honor, and beer. Until next time.